Welcome to Corel Painter Sergeant vs. Master Course, an in-depth series where we will learn about the Sergeant vs. tool set and how to apply them on different subjects such as still life, portraiture, architecture and landscapes. Our classes will have a gradual level of complexity, from simple sketching to more advanced techniques. Whether you are a beginner or an advanced artist, you are welcome to stay with us. We believe there is something for everyone in this course. It's good to see you again. We continue to use frameworks from the first half of our course and applying them to our new techniques and subjects with a little extra. In this class, we open our sensitivities to the beauty of man-made walls, columns and structures and dive into the aesthetics of architecture as our subject for study. As this is a brush-focused course, as usual, I will leave you with just some basic tips, but I urge you to do further research. Take courses and classes on general traditional art and digital art theories. In our last video, I will leave you with some suggestions for some of these resources, so stay tuned! My understanding of architecture is rather limited, but here are some of my personal suggestions. 1. Composition, again. Composition is the core of everything visual, 2D and 3D. So study composition in any way you can. 2. When doing an architecture study, whether plain air or based on a photography, try the less obvious view or angle of that subject. Normally we tend to take frontal shots or shots of the facade of a building or a structure, which is great of course, but try to take views of its corners, different sides and different perspectives and if possible also different heights. 3. Try to capture more abstract angles, compositional lines and shapes of the structure, as well as compositional depth. Or, there is a saying that the devil is in a detail, so explore reliefs, different materials, windows, columns, doors, and any other smaller parts of that structure. 5. Explore the structure under different weather or lighting conditions. Ok, so let's talk about our subject. I always wanted to visit Egypt and see its great architecture and arts also know more about its culture, and so on. Now, I am traveling via Wikipedia, and this is the Temple of the Goddess Isis in Philae. By the way, I have the same name in homage to the goddess. What I like about this photography, taken by Mark Rickard, is how it explores the structure's um, angles and perspectives. I also like the palette and the values very pleasant, given by the natural landscape and climate. For better showing of the technique we are going to do, I will use only part of the reference. So take a print screen of our subject, and when doing this study, remember to credit the reference author. The brush we are using is a grainy pressure knife, and I invite you to see the testing of this brush in class 1 in case you have missed it. So let's learn the basic brush mechanics I use for this study. To cover big shapes and areas, make your edges more organic. Sharp edges tend to look digital and mechanic. If you do sharp edges, however, make sure that you do so on a regular basis, or on a percentage basis in relation to the norm sharp edges for overall painting brush stroke consistency. To fill in large areas, use brush spontaneity to your advantage. You don't need to cover the surface perfectly. Plus, those non-painted spots and variations, um, they will be built up with other colors, creating interesting painterly effects. Color patches and variations on the walls, a bit bigger size, thicker, short brush strokes. 
Gradients Always use brush stroke in the right direction to work on gradients. At the start point it will be faded and the end point will concentrate more color density. Grain texture Quick brush strokes in all directions as a consistent pattern. Plants Always make short, quick, straight and curvy brush strokes following the direction of the leaves for a more natural look. Overall smaller details is just a bunch of dabbing, um, quick, short and long brush strokes. The first thing we will do is to divide the planes in the right order so we can solve them from the furthest to the closest one to the viewer. Plane 1 is the sky, plane 2 the rocks and the tower on the background, plane 3 is the smaller structure to the right behind um, the main towers, and plane 4 is the main towers, plane 5 the doors in front of the towers. Plane 6, the broken wall to the left and the broken small columns to the right. Plane 7 is the plants. Plane 8, the sand for a ground. We will mix the minimalist realism sketch approach from class 3 for the start of the painting process with the nuance and texturing of the complex approach in class 4 for the rest of the process. And remember, you can always do a drawing as a guideline if you think that helps you. So we start by doing a mapping of the overall image, like you have learned for the landscapes in class 5. I have the mapping done here and you see the average or dominant color of each of these planes. As you remember, they are achieved by first finding the hue, then the value range, and last, the saturation range. I put each one in a separate group as well as we will come back to each of these parts. Also notice how they are big enough in certain areas so they can be overlapped. Notice that in a minimalist way I am not worried about having exact edges as long as I get my shape and proportions mostly right. And the average color for most of the temple is exactly the same in theory but to distinguish these different parts, I have made them slightly lighter or darker. I carry on minimalistically and I forget about the sky for now, as it doesn't have any notorious transitions, shadows or highlights for us to work at this point. So I move on to the second plane and I can add either the basic or notorious highlights or shadows. I go for the highlights this time because in my artistic mind they are underneath the shadows of the tower to the right and quite independent to, um, on the stands to the left. Now I move on to the shadows. You see me hanging a bit on the shadows here while well, I'm trying to figure out what color value works um, best as well as where to end the shadow for the given moment. I move on to the next plane and I repeat the same process. Then in plane 4, notice all the overall highlights are just slightly lighter. The thing I feel when using this brush is that the brush strokes slide out of my control sometimes, as um, the thickness of the stroke varies very much with the tilting and pressure. Which is very very cool for more loose and painterly types of artworks. Here, 
I tried to fix the overall shapes and proportions of the shadows. We move on to the next plane and apply the notorious highlights and shadows in a reload and repeat basis. Notice on the plants that the shadows are either dark orange or dark green and this is such a good opportunity to stress out that on daylight in real life it is highly unlikely that you will see any black shadows. This is something you see in photography or film because the camera so far cannot capture the full range between light and dark. So you either compromise on the shadows or the highlights when you click the camera, even if you adjust a thousand settings. Um, some use some HDR techniques, but they are also, um, they also destroy the values. So my best tip ever for you is take notes and studies on natural lighting. We don't need to do anything with plan 8 because it's a nuanced work, so we come to that part much later on. So now we start the part, adding some qualities of the complex approach in class 3, but adapting them to the painting style with this particular brush. The qualities I want to implement now are color value nuance, a finer texturing and overall details. So start with the sky, which has a very subtle nuance or gradient. It is easy to see how much more depth it gains just because of it. And we start seeing some more of the delightful painterly effect of the grainy pressure knife. We move on to plane 2. And for the first time in this course, you see me zooming in in a study. And that's because I wanted to see more clearly um, the gradients and texturing we are going to apply. I work some nuances on the lights and shadows as well as a gist of texturing. We move on to plane 3, repeating the process. Um, I am not doing any of the darkest shadows as you see in windows or doors on purpose because I am leaving these elements for much later on. Sometimes during the painting process you see me speculating and testing different ways of doing some details. The little shadow here, for example, was too dark for my value range at this point, so I turn it up. On plane 4, I start a new one's process for the shadows. We always attempt to the value and color differences in the shadows for a more natural results. I start applying some patches of color for the side of the tower to evoke the different textures and nuances. So now I am making these lines to show you a point. 
In some techniques, there are some details that are better omitted because they can break the overall brushwork visual harmony, and this is such a case. So I get rid of them. I apply this layer with this abstract pattern in a subtle lower value and low opacity to evoke the faint idea of grain. I start adding patches of colors to the sides of the second tower, then on the front of the first tower. Notice all these colors are just some subtle nuance. Off we go to the front of the second tower. Now we create an abstract pattern to evoke the faint idea of grain on these surfaces as well. I test them and I see they need more density, so I paint over some thicker brush strokes. Then I set it to very low opacity. Finish this area with some last touches, then some of the holes and chipped corners. I don't want to add too many holes here as I think they kind of disturbed. Um, the overall work. So we go further onto the next plane. We start with the nuances of the shadows. And I quickly fix the right side of the entrance, putting it in a right height in relation to the left side. So now uh, we work the nuances of the bricks and the overall texturing or nuances of these walls. Notice I keep being careful with the overall shadows and I am leaving the darkest tones in a complex for later on during the process. Now we move on to the next plane and work on the ruined wall to the left, a bit more loose than on the main building since this is not the focal point. We jump to the ruined columns on the right side. So we move on to work the nuances on the plants, and here I, I work by grouping the elements of the same color. Starting with the, all the orange nuances, then I add the finer, smaller bits of shadows, then the lighter, warmer green leaves, which are the ones the sun shines through. At this point, I see we can miss um, some highlight leaves, but on purpose I am not adding those yet, because I don't know the level of texturing and finishing the work may end up with, so adding those now would make this part over textured in relation to the rest. We move on to work on the sand, and this is a work of nuance, as the tone differences are really small. We add some missing bits of vegetation, then some stones. I think for the purpose of this painting, I'd like to have more life and relief in a sand. Since I think the photo version looks a bit flat. So either I work with very close variations of what is already there, 
or in case of slightly stronger or darker colors, I simply lower the opacity and experiment with it. So now that everything is established and the paint and the painting is mostly done, it is a good time to work on the darkest parts, which are the windows and the doors of the temple complex. At this point, it is easier to have an overview and decide what is the darkest value you want to go in terms of value range for um, this specific study. As I mentioned before, the cameras, regardless of the setting, always miss out on the shadows or the highlights of a capture. So there is always a compromise in the values. And based on studies I have done from real life, the level of luminosity in the darkest areas of the reference should be much greater. On the door to the left, I experiment with um, a yellow hue but it didn't work out so good in relation to what is already established, so I make it more orange-red. I keep adding more of the darker tones on the various openings of the building and the ruined wall to the left. I leave them for now and move on to experiments to test out if adding some of these carvings we see in our reference will actually work for the painting or work against it. The last test if these details are worthy adding to the painting. For this painting I don't want them to be very well defined or clear because um, I know it m would make them quite disturbing. So I just give an idea that there are some carvings. I work the highlights. Actually, I think they look quite nice. They didn't disturb the painting, so I'm leaving them. Now is the time where I start the finishing process and these are some areas where I want to make in um, a slight shadow such as some surfaces of the building. I choose a medium saturated, medium low value orange and set it to gel compositing mode and apply on these surfaces. I don't fill in the shapes perfectly, notice some gaps and this gives a slight idea or hint of the light variations. I create a shape to fill the entire canvas and turn it to overlay compositing mode in low opacity. I experiment with different colors from yellow orange to pink and red. And this is a slight tinting to break down the cold palette of the brush, create overall color harmony and just slightly level the values. The difference is minimal, but as the old saying goes, the devil is in our details. I keep looking for what else can be enhanced on this finishing phase. Now I think we can securely add those highlight leaves on the plants since the level of texturing in the painting has increased overall and that would now be very proper. I finished the darkest shadows 
by adding even more luminosity to them, as I believe they should be. As a final comment to this process, sometimes you'll see me opening a thick, a thick paint layer, but that's because I clicked the button accidentally one too many times. So I have deleted all of them immediately after opening. Then I started a new normal layer, which is where I have done the full process. Overall, despite finding this brush a bit difficult to control, I love the aesthetics of its strokes, how it mixes with the other colors. And I also love how bright and vibrant the colors are, even though they have a slight lower value compared with other brushes. It's very similar to the color saturation system of the Sargent brush itself. So we have come to the end of our sixth class and I hope you found interesting how we can add a fair level of realism um, to the work with the grainy pressure knife, all the while working in a slightly loose style and texturing surfaces with abstract patterns. On our next class you will learn a couple of approaches to painting portraits. So thank you so much for watching, Corel Painter and I hope this class has been helpful to you. Stay creative, stay positive and inspired.